now. So <clears throat> welcome to our, our patrons of the Conditional Release Program. We have a new program for you and you alone at this stage, and it's called the Two Jacks, one of them being me, of course, Jack the Insider, and the other being Hong Kong Jack, a cousin of mine, a real cousin, a blood relative, uh, who's been living in Hong Kong now for the past 13 or 14 years. Uh, dragged there by his wife, apparently. Uh, that's his excuse anyway. But uh, Jack has uh, a long uh, um, a history in politics and the law. Uh, we really want to get him on to talk about a lot of global political issues um, as they arise. We're going to touch on some of them today. Um, uh, but also, uh, just to kick us off, we want to get a feeling for how... Um, uh, COVID-19 is going in Hong Kong, how vaccination rates are working, if they are at all. And, of course, all this done in the spectre of a gigantic uh, a gigantic political uh, being uh, just, over the, just over the water. Uh, Jack, welcome. Nice to be here. Yeah, good on you, mate. And, uh, look, tell us, what's going on in Hong Kong with vaccinations? Well, it's, it's much lower than Australia. I think we're about 64%, and I think Australia's nearly 80 now. Is that right? Yeah, that's total uh, population, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, working on the same figures, we're a fair bit below that. The vaccination rates for young people are, are fairly good. Um, even, the school, even the school age, the 12-year-old plus is up to 77% of those. Um, it just falls away once you get to 60. Um, and that's pretty much... Um, local Cantonese elderly who are not getting vaccinated. In fact, for the over 80s, it's less than 20%, which is very, very low. And one would expect that they would be the most vulnerable part of the population, but they're just not getting vaccinated. And, and what's the reason? What, is there some sort of cultural reason for that? We, the answer is I don't think anyone really quite knows. <laughs> um, uh, the... Um, there's no history in Hong Kong of people being anti-vaccination. There's no history of, um, uh, you know, resistance to childhood vaccinations. It's just amongst the elderly. And it could be, uh, my guess is that they think, well, there have been very few cases here um, uh, and I don't want to travel, so I don't need to be vaccinated. Um, um, so they're just not doing it. But they, they also will tell you, and I know quite a few of the plus 60s, it's my age group these days, um, uh, and, and they will say, well, I think I'm going to die if I get it. But there's but there's never an explanation as to why they think that. Mm. It's very strange. And, and, of course, there are limits placed on entering China um, for those who are unvaccinated, or I think for everyone, aren't there? Yeah, the not borders, in lockdowns, the, but, but accessing the, the, the mainland comes with the borders, a price. The border's effectively closed. Um, right. it, it's obviously it's open for for truck drivers and all that sort of thing. I mean, we wouldn't have anything to eat if we couldn't get access to the mainland. So um, uh, uh, because yeah, we don't grow anything much here, uh, grow money. What should we grow in Hong Kong? <laughs> uh, so uh, there's no there's there's no real access to the mainland, and that's the border that the that the local government here is keen to open up first. Um, we, it's, we're now on three-week quarantines for virtually everywhere. So virtually everybody who arrives in Hong Kong, and they've got to have a visa or be a Hong Kong permanent resident to get in. And that means that, that means they either have a they're either a, a, a Hong Kong um, citizen or they um, are a Hong Kong permanent resident, um, like myself, um, or they have a work visa already granted to get into the city. Uh, and even then. Um, it's from almost everywhere now. It's three three weeks quarantine. If you're lucky, it's three weeks in a hotel of your choice. If you're unlucky, the first seven days are out in a converted container at Penny Bay on South Lantau. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah, lovely. Yeah. <laughs> it's close <laughs> to the beach, I suppose. <laughs> it's surprising people aren't on the streets. If it was Melbourne, yeah. there'd be hell to pay. Yeah, and and, and that's to, that's to make us consistent with the mainland. Right, um, and, and and the mainland's, you know, I, I think the government's actually got this right, um, that the mainland is our most important border. You know, we used to have twenty five million tourist visitors a year in Hong Kong, and now you could probably fit them in, you know, a couple of train loads. You know, uh, 
uh, and most of them, eighty percent of them, came from the mainland, um, and and most of them came by train. I might add. Um, you know, we're on the we're now sort of considered by China to be part of what's called the Greater Bay Area, which is, well, you imagine um, how big is it? It's sort of about a third the size of Victoria, so it's sort of Victoria from Geelong, Ballarat, Bendigo. Um, a fair bit of South Gippsland, except that it's got 86 million people, more than the UK, and it produces it produces 12 percent of um, of China's GDP. So it's um, it's rich, and there's a lot of people there, and they love to come to Hong Kong to buy genuine luxury goods rather than the the ones that you can buy. The, in China. Mm. the ones that the ones they're not quite so confident about. <laughs> Bit of IP, bit of IP <laughs> shuffling there. Yes, that, yes. But uh, China has, of course, a, a zero COVID policy, and, and that's what they're it's sticking much, to. Yeah, and and, <laughs> and 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 we're in the zero COVID zone because of that, because we're mm. you know we're part of China, so we're, we're mm. going to be in the zero COVID. Now, time will tell who's right. We're all doing this on the fly, you know. Um, one wag I know suggested that we might end up like the the Japanese soldiers found in the Philippines in the eighties, the last people who uh, who haven't worked out that the COVID war is over. But um, but it, it may be that the mainland are getting it right. Maybe they're not. Yeah, that's yeah, that's true. But uh, but I guess one of the consequences of that zero COVID policy is where you have, and, and we see this around the world, where you have a little COVID, you have. Uh, declined or, or, or diminished vaccination rates. Uh, yeah, that's, and it's, it's, it's only where you get a bit of infection that people go, gee, crikey, I better go and get vaccinated. Well, 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 that's right. I mean, all of the countries in our region with low vaccination rates uh, or, or with with low case numbers, rather, um, you know, uh, Korea, uh, Taiwan, Hong Kong, uh, Singapore, Australia and New Zealand all had slow take-ups of vaccines um, in the beginning. And I think governments in all those places thought there wasn't much of a rush, you know. Um, uh, and, they, and, and I suspect they thought they were better off sitting back and waiting to see which vaccines were better, which worked better. Um, and it was only when the infection started to ramp up in all of those countries that they started to ramp up the vaccination rate. Singapore's a little bit different. Uh, because mm. they made they made a, an early and public decision that zero COVID wasn't a good plan, and um, yeah. and, and they moved to a living with COVID thing. But part of the deal with that was that they had to ramp up the vaccination rates, and they were successful in doing so. They got excellent vaccination rates. There. Yes, uh, I, I, look, I, I've never had it properly explained as to why the UAE is so high. They're at sort of ninety eight percent single. Dose and that and that's total population. So how that works, I'm not quite sure because that would include childhood, early childhood vaccination for COVID. But after that comes Singapore with uh, with a with a high vax rate uh, of ninety two percent of total population, uh, and Australia by that same sort of measure is in the top ten. But we've really sort of gone ahead in leaps and bounds in terms of where we are and in terms of intent. So you've got a slow rollout that's 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 gathered pace, uh, and uh, and in New South Wales and in Victoria where there was a lot of COVID and still is to be fair, um, uh, we had really high vaccination rates up into the nineties. ACT, I think, just about everybody there's been uh, double dosed, and and now we sort of begin this business of boost uh, boosting. So so, what's the push uh, from the Hong Kong government about boosts? About boost, uh, boost doses. Uh, they're, they're starting to become available. Um, there's no great rush with them at the moment, just because mm. we, we, because we're, we're, we're going to remain, uh, I think, for perhaps for a year in the in the zero COVID zone. Yeah. So that's that's that, that's upsetting to a lot of businesses in Hong Kong. Um, uh, a lot of people are based here. A lot of um, uh, regional headquarters are based here because it's a great hub place fabulous airport easy to get in and out of and you can fly from here to anywhere or you could fly from here to anywhere so mm. um, uh, the government have made a decision i think um to to say well yes that's terribly important but access to the mainland um the billion people and the huge markets across there and all the production across there is more important than 
catering to the whims of um, international business people. Are we seeing some shifts of business uh, from Hong Kong into Singapore, going to places there, like there, Singapore? There, there are rumours every week, you know, of 